Hello guys, welcome back. This is another edition of Holster Life. I'm Andrew Henry. Here's John Hopman from Filster. We did a broadcast a couple of nights ago. If you were here then, thank you very much. We appreciate your time um, with a tool tip. Not the world's most exciting tool tip, very straightforward. It's this guy. You've seen these before. Okay. In the concept phase of design, Lots of guys want to leap into making the physical copy first, making the testable end product first. And uh, I'm not from an art background, although I am a, an instrument builder. John's more of a drawer and an artist than I am. This is a critical element in his design. I use it less frequently than he does, but this is an invaluable way to save yourself time, cost of materials, cost of labor, use a pencil, draw it out first, think on it, and then go to making your physical copy. So tonight's tool tip, pencil. If you like mechanical, if that's your bag, go for it. I kind of like these ones, but that's just me. Um, yeah, so um, drawing is free practice. The more you imagine something, and the, in, in, in the greater the detail in which you imagine it, the more likely it is to be the case when you go to do it. Uh, it's drawing holsters is your dry fire. If you're th thinking about developing a new idea, if you're working out a concept, if you're just starting to, into making holsters, the more you draw, the better your holsters are going to be. One thing that we do, like uh, I've done the, um, the holster boot camps where people come to stay with me uh, uh, for like a week at a time and learn how to make holsters from scratch, I tell them bring a sketchbook and bring uh, a pad of paper. He's watching and making the feed at the same time. I'm trying to super keep meta. Up on John Hotman just joined. Hello, John Hotman. Hey, uh, <laughs> I'm actually trying to keep up on the comments. But at any rate, um, if you fill a sketchbook full of holsters, when it's time to take the hot, take the, the fresh plastic and draw your holster out on it and drill it and bandsaw it you'll have already drawn it so many times that you're going to uh, not be in a position of, you know, fretting over whether or not you make a mistake. Now, obviously, your hand ability with the tools is going to come into play, but... Um, Hello, Red Earth. By the time that uh, my students leave my shop, they're able to just draw a holster out of their head. Um, in some cases, if you're a really high volume shop and you've got a new person and you want to get them up to speed, you give them a template. But the more you draw, the more you're able to just sit down with a ruler and have and, and create out of your head. So, um, oh yeah, <laughs> Owen's here. He's uh, Owen Owen Martin from Guns Dumpster Dynamics LLC. Hello, Tom Kelly. So now that a few more people have trickled in. A little bit of housekeeping. If you're a holster maker, many of you have already done this. I've seen the comments rolling by. If you're a holster maker, please tag your company name and the city where you operate out of so that we can keep track of who's who. And also, I'd very much appreciate it if you would like the feed and then please share the feed to your page so that other people who follow you but don't know us can also hop in on this and enjoy what we have to offer. So please do uh, like the feed and share the feed quick plug at the beginning. I'm running a coupon on the Swift Press vacuum former right now. The code is FAST40 for 40 bucks off a Swift Press. If you're looking at getting into non-membrane forming and you want a durable machined aluminum robust solution that's plug and play, check out the Swift Press. It's available at henryholsters.com. So the main topic tonight is design. And when people think design, typically they jump to things like you know, what's the shape of the holster going to be, or what attachments is it going to have? And those are a little further down the tree of questions, a little further down the path in terms of constructing a holster design. So what do we design for? What's the first thing we're trying to do? Well, when I approach the design question, I, uh, when, 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 I, Design for me is about solving problems. You uh, either observe a problem in the uh, uh, in the space in your field, and you uh, begin the process of asking the questions of uh, why 
why this problem exists, how do I define this problem, um, what are the factors that contribute to it, and what are the factors that contribute to it not currently being solved. Um, and then in other cases, if you're working in a field like, say, for example, um, Hi, Marco. Hello, Harrison. Thank you for stopping by. So you can in, in encounter a number of uh, challenges. So, for example, back in the day, design problems included how do we build taller buildings and more stable structures. So people develop arches and buttresses and uh, different systems for reinforcing the structure and then making stable, consistent, long-term dwellings, right? So those are physical, basic problems of geometry and physics. And then you get into things like, uh, like, you know, like Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, where all of those problems are solved, and you get into ideas which are more conceptual. You say, you know, like, why is nobody doing it like this? Like, maybe in some cases I can push the limit of what's technically capable, and have something that's functional at the same time, right? So I can set up a problem to solve. I can choose a more difficult landscape on which to build in order to uh, ex you know, create an exercise in exploring the problems inherent in that and maybe challenge the framework of what's usually accepted and then say, well, okay, like let's say I've, I'm in a, a position where there's some convention, and there's a convention of a relatively simple, straightforward, easy way of doing something because that's a well-worn pathway to doing something. It's the tools exist, the materials exist, people are familiar with the concept, it has traction, that's the natural default direction to go. Right, and in some cases, in order to expand the, the vocabulary of solutions, which exist, you need to not just use like small incremental things, you may need to say, okay, well, if we're going to expand the vocabulary of the way things look and the way things behave, we need to set up a problem to solve. So how do I have a, a, a large uh, a structure that overhangs something that's unsupported, right? So we get into those challenges and you wind up with like counter levered and counterbalanced homes that have a very specific uh, uh, design language to them, right? Which aren't necessarily like, you know, just a regular Roman arch like from back in the day. So, uh, From back in the day. Yeah, those Romans back in the day. So for me, design is the question of how do I solve this problem and how do we look good doing it, largely. And that's a little glib, but uh, it, it, it covers both of, both of the, 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 the main issues of design. The uh, overcoming a technical limitation and ensuring that your solution for that technical limitation uh, appears intentional and considerate, right? Because I can overcome a technical limitation with duct tape, right? X, X thing is broken, X thing is damaged, I have created a solution for it which is workable. However, the degree of intentionality and the uh, uh, impressions of quality and intelligence and thoughtfulness and aesthetics which accompany my solution are absent when I use a considerable amount of duct tape to solve that problem. Okay, Michael said that you just brought up an important point with this question. It sounds like you're saying you need to find and create a problem and then fix it. And neither one of us is saying that you have to create a problem. However, you may identify a problem and you might need to create a way to talk about the problem that you see. You might need to create awareness around the problem that you see. It's not always the case that everyone in the space you're working in agrees on the same, you know, these are the top 10 problems in our space. If everyone was working on all the same problems all the same, all at the same time, we'd see a lot of very, very, very similar solutions. But what was that solution we saw today? We saw a solution for Kerry. It's on John's Facebook page. Oh, I'm having yeah. a laugh about it. You basically, it's a, it's a Glock lower <laughs> with an integrated mag carry that runs underneath the dust cover. The grip is chopped short. You gotta draw it, round, not in the chamber, pull the magazine out the front of the gun, put it into the grip, rack around, and then you're ready to fight. There's a term, a solution in search of a problem, and that is a real danger with design, which is why we have testing and why we talk to other people in the space to see 
if we're crazy before we go off on a wild goose chase. Right, and, and skipping ahead a little bit, I'm not talking about making a thing and then after the fact... Finding a problem to fi- justify it. Finding a problem, like post hoc finding a problem which justifies the thing that you've created or inventing a problem which justifies the thing that you've created. Like, for example, this thing, you know, essentially their solution is to eliminate the grip of the gun in order to reduce printing. Printing. Right. First of all, they identify printing as the most significant concealed carry concern. And then secondly, they decided that unloading and disassembling the gun was the best way to solve the printing problem. And they did that in a world of solutions which reduce printing already, in which we are not without a large vocabulary of solutions for solving this problem. So, um, that, that kind of gets me into the, the question. I'm not, I'm not talking about creating a problem. I'm talking about being familiar with the extensive vocabulary of solutions within a space. And then determining if that set of solutions applies to the problem which you've identified. Um, identifying a problem, I have notes and I have ice lord. So these are, um, they might not necessarily be compatible. Little plug if you're not familiar. This is ice lord. We recently discovered it this week. It's brand new at Big Red Liquor here in Bloomington uh, and across Indiana. This is a dollar for a pint and a half can. And it's not bad. It's Totally wild. Better than anything else I've had in this price bracket. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had anything else that was a dollar for a pint and a half can. <laughs> Snob. But, okay, where was I? I have notes and I have beer and they don't always uh, play nice with each other. Okay, so, step one is to be familiar with the current vocabulary of solutions and know the background of those solutions. Know how those solutions came to be. Um what problems do they solve? How do they problem? How do, how do they how how do they solve them? And the arc of problem solving that went into that solution. Uh, the next step is to be capable of reproducing that vocabulary. So if you're an architect and you want to build a doorway, you should know all the different ways of of doing that and be able to execute them, uh, so that you have a mastery of them, and that mastery indicates your familiarity and your ability to use that vocabulary. On a, on a very specific, straightforward level for holster makers, a lot of guys tend to get a little bit dismissive of the standard taco fold, you know, simple inside the waistband holster with about a 10 degree cant and a foamy clip. If you're beginning as a holster maker, that's a great place to start. It's a simple design, it's a well worn path, it has clear function and fit, you know, qualities that you can test, it has readily available hardware. If you can do that design well and understand what it offers and how to execute it consistently, then you've got something under your belt. Right. Literally. Ha. And, huh. and um, you can compare your ability to solve that problem with the long-standing existing uh, solutions. So if you're in a space where your ability to solve a problem on a well-worn path does not exceed the current industry standard, then you might want to consider how quickly you look into finding other problems and then executing solutions in that space. There's there's a reason why musicians often learn to play scales and play, you know, there's a reason to practice the basic chops because it will structure the way you think about problem solving. We were working through, so I've been having some significant problems that's unrelated to holster products but related to process, I've been having enormous problems with my big side automation vacuum former. And part of what John and I have been doing while he's been here is methodically working through a whole list of questions to make sure we understand clearly how all the different controls and parts of this of this machine interact because it's been giving me fits. You know, if if we can't reproduce a problem, he's a car mechanic, so at least you know he's seen this his whole life. People come in. And they, def- they define a problem. They say, this is what's happening. And then he takes the car for a test drive. And guess what? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, of course, because he's got magic hands. 
And so he gets in their car and the, and the gremlins run away. Um, but why I mentioned the simple fold over with foamy style holster is there are other more specialized applications and more specialized kinds of holsters that you can get into. And I think some young holster makers or some guys who are new to the field, regardless of their age, try to jump too quickly into a, um, a very feature rich, more complex appendix holster or some other design that's trying to do a lot of different things at once. Start simple, execute to an extremely high level, then expand outward, then identify new problems and find creative ways to solve them. Right, because you could enter in a, into a situation where you're eager to solve a number of problems, don't necessarily have the chops to solve them, and then can't isolate what you're doing wrong. If you're making a number of mistakes in a number of areas, the refinement becomes very difficult, at which point you need to cut back what it does and focus on one thing at a time in order to isolate the problems that you're having. So at any rate, uh, be familiar with the vocabulary of solutions, be capable of reproducing that vocabulary, determine if those solutions achieve your goals. If you have product goals, if you ask a question, how do I make a, a comfortable, secure, ergonomic holster, right? There are existing solutions which achieve those goals. Uh, you can uh, master that vocabulary of solutions. And, uh, you know, when I learned how to play an instrument, I did a lot of playing by ear. I'd sit there with some artist that I really liked, and I'd play along with it. If I liked a, an artist when I was a painter, I'd get into sort of like analyzing their process and analyzing the way their, their, their composition was, and I'd make a lot of stuff that looked like it, you know, and I'd do it over and over and over again. Um, and I'd play the same song over and over and over again. And, you know, when I wanted to make a holster, I made the same holster over and over and over again. Uh, Thankfully, you don't do that anymore, right? No, yeah, every, every single Everyone time. is a unique and special snowflake. Um, so, if... Uh, if the existing solutions achieve the goals that you have for your product, um, determine your reason for reproducing them. Either you can do it for your enjoyment, um, but if you're setting out to make a product, a marketable product, you need to know what your reasons are for making the thing. And especially in a space in which the problem that you're attempting to solve or the goals that you have for your product are common, right? So, uh, so for example, if you want to make a secure ergonomic holster at a certain price point, you need to ask, what are my reasons for entering into that space? Is it price? Is it availability? Is there an absence of quality, which I see? Uh, are there additional options, which I would like to provide that don't exist on the market? Um, and that, like I mentioned before, requires a familiarity with what's out there. So, I mean, that's how you wind up avoiding a situation of being, look, we've just invented something brand new, which due to just not having a familiarity with what's out there. Reinventing the wheel and not realizing it and then presenting it as though it's amazing and everyone's like, it's a wheel. Right, it's like, we have wheels. What's about, what about this wheel? Now, you know... Um, so the next step is, if the current solutions do not accomplish your goals, why is that taking place? Is it a are there uh, is it due to the you know technical or material obstacles? You know, are people not making a X widget because are, are people not making widget X out of material Y because material Y can't actually do that? Are people not making X widget out of material Y because it will be worse? out of that material or more expensive or more expensive or take longer or uh, fail in some other way not be as durable you know you need to know the reasons that X thing gets made Y way um, is there no market need are people not making X widget out of Y material because someone had in the past and they went out of business because nobody bought it uh, generally Companies that are smart and react to the market tend to get rid of products that cost them too much money to make and don't justify that, don't bring in a return. 
There's a reason why big companies offer what they offer. It's not because they enjoy bleeding money on products that don't sell. So a, an item that came up recently in discussion on uh, one of the Kydex Facebook pages was handcuff cases. Now, generally, the majority of people carrying handcuff cases are on-duty law enforcement. Military doesn't carry them, and most civilians don't and shouldn't. Um, there's no reason to be carrying handcuffs as a civilian. And so... Um, you don't have any reasons for carrying handcuffs. I have no reason for... Well, okay. Most civilians, legally, the way our laws in this country work, there are very few justifiable situations where you, as a civilian, would need to deploy handcuffs against somebody. Um, but there are lots of handcuff cases on the market. Many of the big companies make a lot of very viable, durable, cost-effective solutions. I don't see any need for me, to, for me to get into that space. I can't speak for your business. But I don't see a need for myself to get into that space because the problem has already been solved effectively by many other companies, and I wouldn't bring anything new to that product. So I just don't go there. Also, making a handcuff case out of Kydex doesn't necessarily solve a lot of the problems that people have with carrying handcuffs, if we're going to be totally honest. First of all, handcuffs are wildly different from one another, and molded plastic is a product-specific solution. Uh, which then requires you to either have the handcuffs and have a lot of different handcuffs. The fitment is a challenge versus um, pliable solutions uh, insofar as uh, the fit on molded plastic is very specific. So the cuffs have to go in a certain way and fit a certain way. And, be and when you've got them stacked way. and they can shift, they don't fit that well. So the juice in a lot – I mean, I've – explored the, the the issue the juice in a lot of cases just isn't worth the squeeze and you wind up making kydex handcuff carriers for people who think that's what they want rather than it actually being the solution that they desire the most um now in addition to you know uh the, the kind of why questions you need to ask about why the thing you've imagined does not exist um the question to ask is have you invented the problem, right? Are you experiencing this problem because it's esoteric? Um, like, man, I just can't conceal a Kydex holster in my bicycle shorts on a bicycle. Well, that's an extremely esoteric problem to have, A. And B, you, you may not have a solution for it which involves molded plastic. You may be barking up the wrong tree for that. Um, it's gotten mentioned several times in the comments here, so I'm going to respond to it. The, the gun and mag integrated single carrier for appendix carry is, is kind of a controversial product. And I know lots of holster companies make it, and many holster companies that sort of poo-pooed the concept when it first started to become popular on Instagram um, now offer their own version of it. I think one of the interesting things about looking at work from other companies is that when you look at their products, the products show you, insofar as they're executed well, the products show you which problems that company was trying to solve. In the list of priorities of things they wanted this holster design to accomplish, what was at the top? What did they really design the product around? Was it concealability? Was it comfort? Was it modularity? Was it access? Was it deep concealment? Was it having a spare mag with your gun? Was it speed of draw stroke? Was it interchangeability of multiple different firearms? Like whatever their, whatever their priorities are, the writing is on the wall when you look at the product. Their product reveals their priorities. It reveals their view, their perception of the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was going to get to this sort of later... Later in the uh, in, in in the broadcast, but your work is transparent uh, to to anybody who's been doing this for a little while, and especially if you've got a little, if you're dealing with someone who's spent a lot of time designing things, your work is transparent. Um, so all of these questions that we're asking now, here's how we go through the design process. You know, am I am I solving the the problem with the right material? Have I correctly identified the problem? Am I 
uh, ignorant of existing solutions? Am I um, technically capable of doing it? Am I solve? Am I reinventing the wheel in a saturated market? Am I, you know, uh, can I produce a price at a price point that makes it attractive to a customer and profitable enough for me to even be worth doing? Then the what we're doing here is we are defining the box in which this product exists. And what's easy to see is when someone has thought something through, made those choices, and then put those choices into a solution. And uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a, a little brief story. When I was in art school, I had a uh, drawing instructor. And every day he'd come into my studio and he'd look at the drawings that I had made. And he would ask me questions about individual pencil or charcoal marks right he would ask me what does this line describe why is this line here what does this do what does it build what does it function just not just like about the idea that i was having about the way to draw this thing or the artist that i was interested in he would come in he would walk up to the drawing pick a single line on the drawing and ask me why that line was there and at the time i was like 20 years old and i'm like why the hell is this old man asking me these obnoxious questions about this drawing right and i really resented it and i didn't I like couldn't wait for that quarter to be over for to, in order to get a different drawing instructor because it just broke my balls endlessly. Every morning I'd be there with my coffee thinking, oh, Boris is going to come in and he's going to ask me about a line, like a, a single <laughs> line. Welcome back, Gary Gonzalez. And then it occurred to me that he was trying to get me to make the decision in the moment and forced me to have reasons for making that choice. I mean, it's not automatic. I wasn't doing, like, close my eyes and do some sort of, like, Picasso, you know, or Dolly automatic drawing. Are you drawing. saying Picasso painted with his eyes closed? No, no, no I'm, I'm saying that there was, like a, like, a drawing exercise that some artists did where they do, like, automatic drawing the way some writers do automatic writing. Where you okay. just put the pencil down and start moving, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Right? So to Don't avoid... do that with a bandsaw. Don't just put kayaks up there and start moving, and whatever happens, happens. Because what's going to happen is an ER trip. Um, so instead of surrendering to like full subconscious automatic action, if you are building the drawing or building the thing, you need to have intentionality behind every choice that you make, right? So he was getting me into a place where I was not inventing post hoc rationalizations or otherwise known as excuses for the way the thing was, with the way it appeared, the way it described the world, and what it said about drawing. So now when I make a holster, when I do the drawing, I have a set of plans, and there aren't things in there which are not the result of a deliberate choice. Seriously, this guy draws. He blows up my phone sometimes with sketch after sketch after sketch. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just a CAD guy. I like numbers. Um, so don't turn bugs into features, right? Don't make a thing and go, oh, well, this could be a little bit better. So I'll come up with a reason why it's not better, which doesn't have to do with a failure. I'm not turning a bug into a feature. And here's the thing. When you're dealing with people who have made the same thing a lot, or have made the same thing that you're making and have encountered the same problems that you're making and know the challenges of what you're doing, they They'll can, know they can read you like a book. And when somebody shows a product and says, oh, well, it does this and this and the other thing, and you can, you can smell the... Uh, you can smell the excuses coming off of it, and you can hear, excuse me, the bullshit. And it is there, and it is transparent, and it is on the surface. And whatever, and whenever you're in a circumstance where you say that the thing is a certain way when it isn't, people can read it. You're not fooling anybody. Nobody is. And that's one of the reasons why I only say what the thing does, which I intended it to do. And if something is an unintended consequences, an, an unintended consequence, like. I discovered that it also did this afterwards. I say that that happened. Yeah. And I'm honest about it. I say that I designed it to do X, Y, and Z. And in testing, I found that 
it does this other thing which is a side benefit and I don't list it as a feature. I list it as a side benefit or an ancillary uh, 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 feed, you know, um, not feature, it, it's, 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 it's just a bonus. a bonus. It's just a bonus and I say that it's a bonus. Like this holster also happens to fit SIG P226s made between January 17th and March 25th, 1995. So, like, none others. so, for example, what you'll notice is that if you make a taco-style um, AIWB holster, when you try to draw it away from your body, and all of them will do this, even ones with like really mediocre retention, the more you pull it away from yourself, the more it will lock up. I don't list that as a feature because I didn't do anything intentional about that, although it is a side benefit, and I mention it as a side benefit. It can also be a hindrance to people who don't know how to draw a gun really well. But knowing how obvious um, the excuses are, put yourself in a position where you're not making them. And that's a big part of the design process, is having intentionality at every step. It is shaped like this because going into it, right? The, the shape of the holster should be solving a problem which you experienced in other holsters, or other versions of your own product. Uh, the intentionality is everything. And in addition to that, we could all make functionally intentional things, but another important thing to talk about is uh, design language, which we'll get into. I'm going to see what you have to say. I'm going to break this up a little bit. I'm going to okay. be my ice lord. I'm about to take your notes away because we're going like, to get this free flow thing going. It's been really I, it has been a really notes, long week. The notes are a crutch. I, I, it, I'm, I'm flying out tomorrow, and I definitely feel like I'm crashing. I'm like, oh, earlier but today, I'm like, we should do a live I'm going to do another slave one. drive this guy tomorrow up until I put him in the car to drop him off at the Indianapolis airport. So a few things about um, the form versus function balance, and it really is a balance. If you have a particular function you're trying to execute, there's only so many ways you can do it, Ice Lord. And so, oh, by the way, if you're on Instagram, check them out at, at Ice Lord Beer. They have very few followers you can get in on the ground floor. Um, if you are trying to do, if you're trying to execute a certain function, you want the, the product to perform in a certain way, there are probably a limited, finite number of ways that you can actually make it do what you want it to do. Per, uh, per given material choice. Yeah, when we're working with Kydex and you want to carry a certain model of gun in a certain position on the body, there probably are not an infinite variety of ways to do that, but a limited number of ways to do that. And some are better, some are worse. What I see when I look at lots and lots of holsters that you know come across my feed on Instagram or, or Facebook, um, what all and I almost always see, especially in young companies who don't have a really well seasoned product line, is that they have made decisions that are purely form, purely appearance-wise, oftentimes for branding or try to, to try to set themselves apart. And those decisions actually run counter to the function of their work. They make design decisions for looks, for aesthetic, for branding, for ID, that actually reduce the effectiveness of their design. I remember a number of years ago, there was a guy who was making these holsters and they all had a really deep, acute, like, V-shape cut out of the front of them. Yes. Which was, to anybody who knew the material... A funnel for cracks. Right, just a... a, a like, you couldn't more deliberately design the component to fail. Like... We it, take it, all the stress and we concentrated at this point in line with the grain of the plastic and voila. Right, at the point where it flexes the most. So you've got like a fold over taco holster with this V cut right down next to the trigger guard which guarantees that after a hundred draw strokes you'll have stress fractured the plastic until it begins to split. And uh, it was distinctive. I mean, you know how it was dist I can tell it was distinctive because I remember it now four years later. But it wasn't it wasn't great. I mean, it was the basics of a, a, a brand. Now, like, design language does a few things. It 
gives you brand consistency. If you have, we have some holster clinic fans here. Yeah. Now we're not we're not saying that product is not on the market. I'm sure it still is, and there are other products like it. Hello, Adrian. Concealment. Thank you for stopping by. Um, yes. And Tom Kelly points out that other people copied that design language without <coughs> understanding it and right. without considering the cost of it. So the upsides of design language is that it gives you brand consistency. If you have uh, repeating forms and aesthetic elements, Hi, Tyler. you can accomplish those without sacrificing the function, right? If, if I know that I'm going to, you know, like, if cars, if looking at cars is a great place to look at uh, uh, design language and brand consistency. And also, like, do you remember, like, this was, like, back in the 90s when, like, uh, all those, like, Michael Graves products started showing up at Target. They were all those, like, soft-touch, uh, kind of, like, uh, modern-looking, sleek, minimal Bauhaus kind of uh, kitchen appliances at a place like Target, and it was, like, really cool. And they all shared certain elements. There were, like, repeating visual themes... There were repeating color schemes, there were repeating shapes, and repeating patterns, and repeating materials, and they all shared this... They shared some DNA. They, they looked like family. Right, they looked like family. Now, that does some things. It makes you an identifiable brand. Um, it puts you in a position of having a set of solutions from which to draw when you encounter a problem, like... Uh, uh, like if you look at like a like a like a like a like a car brand, and they say, okay, well, we want to make sure that our new product line has like motion in it, you know, and we're gonna have motion and and some sort of like uh, flow and flow shape. and aerodynamics, and we're gonna sort of do this, you know. I've been looking at this kind of fish, and it looks really cool, and they've got this shape that goes down the side of the fish, and you know, what we're gonna do is every sort of plain transition on on this face of the car, we're gonna treat with this specific kind of design element. So whenever we go from this panel to that panel, we're going to have this element here which, you know, draws your eye through, which might normally be a clumsy transition, right? Think Pontiac Aztec. Oh, yeah, that's, that is the, <laughs> just the, 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 the design pinnacle. epitome of let's take a shoebox, make it uglier, put wheels on it, and sell it to the general public. So... Um, the design language gives you a consistent set of uh, solutions to draw from, uh, in order to solve maybe v like visual problems or aesthetic problems, you, it's like uh, it, uh, there are tools in a toolbox. You say, okay, well, this doesn't necessarily look quite right, but in X, Y, and Z other product, we do it like this, so we'll repeat it through there. And it can be as simple as uh, just the way you deal with uh, a sight channel, they'll behave the same, or the way you deal with a sweat guard all behaves the same. It accomplishes the function that you want, and it has a, uh, a visual repetition, which is homogenous through your product line. So other places where I see it are shape of ejection port blocking is a big one, mm -hmm. forward angle, rear angle, straight angle, swept curve, or shape of trigger guard blocking. Right. Which now with it can trigger also guard be blocking, you start messing with function. So you don't want an overly complicated or overly deep trigger guard blocking area, but curved versus straight versus angled versus you know, there are a whole bunch of different options there that do differentiate your brand if and, you do them consistently and there could be opportunities for um, uh, aesthetic decisions there which we haven't really necessarily fully explored yet given some of the technical capabilities that we have um, you know the way things mount together uh, is an opportunity f you know anywhere that you're overcoming a technical challenge do it with flair. Right. It's, you know, am I, problem, am I solving this problem and looking good doing it uh, without interfering with, the, with you know, or without creating an additional obstacle? Continue. So um, you, uh, it, it gives you a way to solve a problem consistently th throughout a, a product line, and it also lets you look good doing it. And they can also, the other thing about design language is that it can evoke an idea or a feeling. It can also be referential to something else outside of the product itself. Like we mentioned with uh, like cars, you can, you know, sit there and you can... Hi, Maureen. Uh, uh, 
you know, like say I want to have something that looks like a certain kind of snake. There's a pattern on a snake that I like, and I, there's a shape in here that I'm going to uh, repeat because it it has a certain like strength or you know anything that that you want. If you're getting a feeling uh, from some external pattern or design or shape or element or, or image, which you can abstract into the form that you're working with uh, in terms of the product, and if it's recognizable to other people, you can use that as a point of distinction as well. So. Um, the design language makes your group of products homogenous, and it can also communicate uh, ideas or sensations to the user if they happen to share a similar experience with you. Now, often when we when we use the word homogenous, depending on the context, homogenous can be a bad thing. Like homogenous equals lame, homogenous equals boring, homogenous equals samey samey. When you're dealing with a a, a spread of products that you make. Homogenous means identifiable. Homogenous means consistent. consistent. Homogenous means intentional every time. So um, it's interesting to me. I like to play a game where I am you know, swiping through my feed, and if I see a holster, I swipe past the label, or I just make myself look at the picture and not read the text and try to ID it cold. And there really is an element of certain brands and certain holster makers. Here's looking at you, Mike Sedlicek, with your red eyelid. There are certain small things that individual makers do that bring them significant brand visibility, brand consistency, and product um, cohesion across their line of products. And there are other times where I'm like, swipe, 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 swipe. I look at a holster, I'm like, could be anybody. Got nothing. It's cryptic. It's got a foamy on it. Who knows? Could be anything. Could be anyone. And so, generally, more brand differentiation, more distinctive aesthetic is a positive feature except when it either causes your labor cost to go way high or it weakens your material. There was a whole story I was looking at years ago where the guy had decided to dif differentiate his outside the waistband pancake holster he was going to drill a bunch of holes through it just so there were a bunch of holes like a, like a swiss cheese holster and i remember looking at it and going wow it's a really cool visual concept you can you know see the gun but that's gotta be weaker that that can't possibly be you know when you drill that many half inch size holes it's not as strong anymore and then that puts you in a position of there are some really cool things out there which are not durable. They're art pieces. It is entirely legitimate to go into this to make decorative show pieces. There are plenty, plenty of people who do things like glass blowing and woodworking and textiles and jewelry and furniture that make pieces which are not for everyday use. They're conceptual pieces, they're design exercises to take a particular element and just do it to an extreme. Right, and that is fantastic. I love seeing when people take something Exactly, Michael Holland, tie and take holsters. it as far as it can possibly go because having done that, we know what the outer limit of the material is at any given moment and that I then can access that language to any degree that I want. I can... Uh, that road exists. You don't have to go all the way down it, but you can go part of the way down it if you want to. Hello, Keith Freeman. Has Matt Holsters in the house? Yeah, Michael, they are amazing designs. Oh, they're tremendous. They're works of art. Now, am I going to wear it to a cart, to a, like a pistol class and roll around in the dirt with it? Am I going to Am I going to wear my... Millennium Falcon my, like, Phoenix holster. My, my TIE Fighter holster to ECQC? No. I'm going to wear it to a barbecue. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to keep it in my shelf uh, and, 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 and look it's, at it. It's totally legit to make and enjoy holsters as art. Anything can be art. It's totally fine. But try to keep the streams separate. Things that are art conceptual pieces generally sacrifice function to get there. And things that are function-driven 
often have to cope with hard limits right. on aesthetic goals in order to execute effectively. Nobody's making suspension bridges out of delicate gold filament. For yeah. a reason. Stuff is expensive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the Han Solo blaster. That one actually uh, doesn't have... Aside from its sheer length, there's nothing about that that um, makes it fragile, which I was pretty pleased with. Yeah, perfectly functional except bulky. Yeah. So about design language, one of the things that we've both seen and it's been discussed among between us and among many other holster makers is when you see a holster maker borrowing or in some cases just straight up copying a design element from another company's product and you look at it and it's clear from how the copy was executed that the copier did not understand the purpose of the original element at all. Right. That relates back to um, be familiar with the current vocabulary of solutions and know the background of those solutions in order to be genuinely capable of reproducing them. Does this mean you have to be up on every single holster maker on Instagram? No. I'm not. Generally, I use Instagram to follow people whose work inspires me. I mostly follow machinists because those guys do things that boggle my mind. I do follow holster makers, but there is a point to doing market research and seeing how else, how other people solve the problem you're trying to solve. That doesn't mean you have to be an an encyclopedia able to recognize every competitor's holster, you know, but instantly. But you're, you're, you should be familiar at least with your neighbors. If you're saying, I want to build a holster which, um, you know, the kinds of people who perform uh, certain kind of activities. If you're making duty gear, know what's out there. Right. If you're, doing, if you're making duty gear, you should own Safari Land holsters. You should have some of them. You should know people who use them. You should know people who have been using them for years. Yep. And be able to accurately compare your work to theirs right and this gets us into using experts yeah right jace powell commented on using the the vg2 claw on light bearing holsters yeah i'm not going to call anybody out by name but just a couple nights ago we were sitting around eating pizza and somebody pulled up a picture of uh a light bearing inside the waistband holster where somebody had stuck a vg2 claw next to the light bezel and light body and the claw was projecting out, you know, this far off the side of the body. The holster made the overall package outrageously bulky. Or putting or putting a claw in the holster such that it's not actually in alignment with any of the belt mounting hardware. Yeah, if you run the belt, if you run the claw so low, it's like, what's the point? What do you, you gain? It's so you can reach into your pocket and push on the claw. If you need to suddenly conceal the holster. Right. So. If you see design elements in somebody else's holster that you like or are interested by, uh, one thing you can do, and this can be done well or this can be done really badly, one thing you can do is contact the maker and say, hey, I noticed this feature. I think it's totally cool. Can you help me understand a little bit of why you did it that way? And depending on who they are and who you are in relation to them and how you approach it, you may get a very cordial, you know, a very cordial answer that explains, you know, why they built the feature that way. You might get a cold shoulder. It's life. Move on. But you may find out useful things. And you may find out that some of their decisions leading up to that feature are things you never considered. And if you'd copied it without understanding it, if you derived from it without grasping why it was the way it was, you wouldn't receive nearly the benefit you would from using it or adapting it while understanding it fully. Right. And if you don't if you can't go direct to the maker, you can take a look at the users. That's an important thing too. So if there's someone out if there are people out there who are within a certain crowd and they're talking about a certain kind of holster, you can you can find out about the product based on the people who are using it. Um there's a reason that you see a lot of Safari Land gear on military po- and police uh, uh, officers, and that you don't see quite as much Phobos 
right? <laughs> um, and, it, and it's based on the experience of the user. So when you see, if there, if there are folks who are doing certain kind of work and involved in certain kinds of training, like if all the guys uh, you know who are doing jujitsu tend to like holsters which, with certain kinds of features, that tells you something about the utility of those features. Right now, that's a little bit of a, a, an appeal to consensus fallacy, but it's also a little bit of best practice as well. Like you right? have to take into account what real life testers actually do with your gear. And in order to make your gear better, it's helpful to put it in the not just look at the dude who's popular and copy his stuff. What's better is to put it in the hands of the people in the same kinds of the, right back. the hands of the users who are doing the same thing. So um, my friend, uh, a friend of mine, uh, did a lot of work for a long time as a bouncer at a place where he got into a lot of fights and where I knew that instead of giving it to someone who was like, you know, a mall cop and just getting their opinion or someone who just sort of like carries a gun casually and getting their opinion about it, I gave the gear to the person I knew who was at the most, at the greatest risk of pushing it to its, pushing it beyond its limits. And sure enough, the feedback that I got from that allowed me to make design changes and focus on certain things which I had not necessarily thought about, just because I'm not at that great a risk of getting into seriously dangerous fights every night. I mean, like, that's not my lifestyle. I mean, I I live in a big city and there's some amount of risk, but it's not, I don't put myself in a position where I have to grapple angry drunks every night. And that's gonna give you a different set of data than giving it to someone who maybe, you know, rides in a truck all day. You know, they're gonna give, they're gonna have a different set of criteria. And if you <clears throat> wanna get certain answers and you wanna make certain improvements, it's important to identify the users of your gear and in order to improve your gear get it into their hands and accept their feedback and uh, and make the revisions and make the adjustments so you might not necessarily if that identifying your users and getting their feedback frees you from imitation and repetition it allows you to make authentic decisions based on your own reasoning and, and, and a real set of identifiable criteria rather than just kind of like aping what's popular. And good testers also free you from the danger of an echo chamber. And especially if you have a small local community or you run in the same circles in terms of training methodology and doctrine, you can easily get into an echo chamber. I'm not picking on any particular holster makers, but... Um, Generally, I think speed is overvalued, and I think that oftentimes speed comes at the expense of other things. Um, obviously, we're always dealing with trade-offs. Convenience, I think, is overvalued as well in some ways. Like, but it goes on and off so easily and quickly. So yeah, this there are certain factors that are highly valued by people who don't have a lot of experience. And as you go up the curve of people who have progressively more and more experience carrying and using holsters, especially if they do it for a living, certain kinds of priorities emerge. Certain things appear that are valued by those people whose lives depend on that gear. And those, those things are undervalued by people who do that occasionally for fun, when they feel like it, you know. Um, the retention on my holsters, like over the past three years, it's gotten progressively lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And not because my personal preferences have changed, but because I've gradually been trying to dial back the number of emails I get where the person says, I got the holster and it's really, really tight. And usually that lists for me a response like, well, what kind of belt are you using? And usually that gets a response like, well, I just my belt. You guys see where I'm going with that. And so I have to adapt to the market of what my customers actually use. I don't want to send out unusable holsters. 
But I know among the men that I send holsters out to who train and who carry and who do jujitsu or who are bouncers or do plainclothes law enforcement. There's a hard floor to how easy that gun is allowed to like, come out of that Like, if you get in a tussle, that gun has to stay put. If you have a single attachment point and it fails, that gun's gone. And if that gun's gone, you don't have it, and somebody else in the fight can or does have it. And that is no good. But that also depends on, on your users. I mean, I think... I genuinely believe that the vast majority of the people who buy like an Uncle Mike's soft sock of a holster have a perfectly fine experience with it beca- Seriously. because of their lifestyle. They yeah. they they aren't picking the best holster on the market, but they're picking the best value for their lifestyle. Right. Like they're going to put the gun on occasionally when they go to the store or they're going to wear it as a talisman or they're going to put it in the safe or they just they don't really push it that hard so you know for a lot of people hi john keller thank you for stopping by their standards just aren't that high so something with low standards exceeds their minimum their, standards yeah exceeds their exceeds their requirements a little bit of housekeeping if you've joined the feed since we started I would very much appreciate it if you would like the feed and please share the feed on your personal page. John and I are both pretty well known in the holster community, but there are lots of people who have not heard of us, who have never run across our work, who have not seen any of my Facebook Live videos, and I would appreciate it if you would share the feed on your page so that folks who haven't heard of us have the opportunity to do and check it out if they enjoy it. So, um, one thing I was going to talk about is how an easy way to learn the design process is to identify something that actually works and is relatively popular and solves a problem in a way that you think is clever. Yep. And actually research that thing because as we were talking previously, design is transparent, right? If you get one and you use it, it will tell you about why it is that way. Yep. Um, so if you're dealing with an honest designer, the the product description of the thing will tell you how to go about that kind of design, right? Yeah. Because it you, it's an open book. It, learn des- it it describes the problem they identified and the solution that they applied to it, and then you can obtain the thing and experience whether or not that's verifiably the case. If it says, well, we saw that there was a problem with how X, Y, and Z seems to work, and so we came up with this solution, and you buy the thing, and it doesn't turn out that X problem was actually all that problematic, and, you know, their Z solution doesn't really solve anything, then then you can, you know, that that tells you something different than you go, oh, wow, you know what? I was having that problem, too, and I get the thing, and it actually works. And it going to take a little bit of analysis it might take a little bit of disassembly you might have to take things apart sometimes but not like i've ever done that to somebody else's holster no i mean but they don't care if you take it apart you once you bought it it's yours cut it to pieces if you want to <coughs> um when it comes to uh looking at other people's designs one thing i've seen over and over and over again that gets a red flag from me every time I read it or I hear it in an ad video or anything. Um, every time I see a holster company marketing themselves and the owner says, you know, I carried a gun and I want to carry it, wanted to carry a holster, but I couldn't find anything on the market. I couldn't find anything on the market you go, that was oh, comfortable here and comes. concealed my full size holster. And so I made this the ah! holster sling, you know, <laughs> or like, like you can the bungee bag <laughs> right like the, the the low information inventor you if, don't, don't be the guy who's the low information inventor who buys their first thing goes oh well i made a poor choice about my gun selection for what i you know like i bought a ruger p95 for concealed carry and there weren't a lot of holsters at the gun store where I bought it, and it seemed kind of big and uncomfortable. So I invented the 
Death Trap Holster, <laughs> which is a 90, 99 cent solution guaranteed for you to lose your gun and harm yourself, right? Hello, like, Troy. Like, if, in, if inventing you... is about exploring what exists, because if you're, if you're not sufficiently knowledgeable about the existing solutions, the reasons that they exist, and, and how they've described the problem, then, then you're just... <laughs> the death trap holster, yeah. All right, the, the gun dumpster 9000. <laughs> no, so like there, there are tons and tons of solutions on the market that are just obviously just out there in la-la land. And if you are a gun owner, and in today's market, with the internet, with Amazon, with all the stuff we've got, if you could not find a holster that works for you, that works for you, two things: either you stink at Google and just find the nearest eight-year-old child and say, "This is what I'm looking for," and they'll Google and find the thing you're looking for, or you made a horrendous firearm choice. Like I could not find a good concealable hybrid holster for my cap and ball revolver, or like my black powder blunderbuss. Like, well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason nobody makes a holster for that because nobody carries it, and sure. there and there are reasons that they don't carry it. And if you persist did an in afternoon's worth of, of of research, you or took one ECQC class with a black powder blunderbuss. You would discover exactly why that's the case, and uh, where are we going with this? I, are we are we starting to like retread some of the stuff? No, we're, we're not. About? We're not retreading. I was talking about low information inventors, and the balance between paying attention to what's around you and being paralyzed by the way everybody else is doing it. It's certainly possible to to spend all your time looking at everybody else and not doing. If you have a great idea, fantastic. Ideas as abstractions are worthless. Only when you can execute the idea well does it begin to matter. And then you get into, can you sell it? Can you support it? Can you warranty it? Can you distribute it? Can you get it out there? Okay. But an idea by itself, everyone has ideas. There are tons of ideas out there in the market. So, like, yeah, guys who want to make Desert Eagle holsters, like, I just... You can get in... I mean, there there is a market for Desert Eagle holsters. You could be... The, the Desert Eagle holster you could maker be the to the stars. Eagle guy. Like, <laughs> and, and the people with Desert Eagles, I mean, they're, they're toys. So people are going to spend toy money on them, you know? They're going to spend, like, gun toy enthusiast money on them. I mean, we could corner the Desert Eagle market tomorrow. We could go out and buy one. And cat it up, and be the only people who make, you know, and get all get all the zebra stripe, zebra print, uh, uh, gold leopard find, print, kydex that we can find, and corner off the market. But you know, if you neither one that, of us could live with these with with ourselves or with the other one if we did that. Hey, how do you sleep at night? Like a, a baby. pile of mud. <laughs> a pile of mud. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a great joke of uh, the first rule of Dunning Kruger Club is you don't know you're in Dunning Kruger Club. So I, I like you see immediately the low information inventor being the guy who didn't have great justifications or reasons or rationale for purchasing a specific gun, then carrying that gun or knowing any of the prevailing contemporary training and education wisdom and then didn't do any holster research and then decides to invent something. Or invents it and just like decides to bring it to market. And it obviously hasn't been tested, runs totally counter the grain of, you know, of what are accepted best practices in terms of carrying and deploying a firearm. And you just look at it and go, How'd you get here? Now, quick little plug for somebody who's unconnected to either of us, although you know him, I think. Um, 
If you don't read Grant Cunningham's blog, you should. Oh, yeah. Grant Cunningham There are has a great very blog. few other guys who bring the perspective he brings to the firearms training and carry market with one key point that I want to emphasize. Grant is always keyed in on the distinction between people who train as a hobby because they enjoy training, they enjoy gun classes, they enjoy shooting, they enjoy marksmanship, and people, which is this other group is the vast majority of people who purchase and maybe carry or keep at home a firearm as a, a self-defense tool in which they do not have or are not willing to invest very much time, attention, or money in training and carrying. It doesn't actually take an extraordinarily high level of training for a person to effectively deploy a firearm in self-defense. We don't all have to be Jedis. And a lot of guys who are tr who are into training, take lots of classes, do so because they enjoy it. Not because having a sub .92 draw from concealment is actually the deciding factor in most gunfights. It's not. Speed reloads, as far as gunfights are concerned. It's amazing to see how many instances where someone seems to be able to defend themselves without actually hitting any of their targets. I, I saw an, <laughs> ar an article a while back about a guy <clears throat> who was attacked by six guys he had his FN 5.7 with 20 rounds in it, Woo! emptied the gun, hit no one, and everyone ran away. Now They were all deaf and traumatized. Right, like all those rounds, 20 rounds just sort of like went into the ether and magically hit nobody innocent, thankfully. But, but he had a 0 for 20 hit rate out of his incredibly easy to shoot gun against six attackers right that's a lot of flesh to miss and he won and you know i mean he's he survived he survived the attack the attackers stopped attacking him like if you if you draw your gun and fire the gun and the attacker stops attacking you yeah comrade i would leave two if somebody shot at me 20 times but um for sure that's what, like, or you pull up uh, videos of uh, convenience stores getting robbed, and you see people just, like, run out the door, and the glass is flying everywhere, and, like, occasionally maybe one of the guys gets hit, right? But, like, the accuracy stand standards are low. So, like, m genuinely, honestly, as much as we might like to change this, most people with guns get by with nothing. Very, what we would consider very suboptimal solutions. We would con we we would consider it to be luck, like pure happenstance. But the degree to which that pure happenstance seems to prevail might, in some cases, be indicative of some underlying minimum requirement. And so, to a degree, the market that we're focused on in terms of gun owners. I mean, like, Uncle Mike's has that happenstance market Corner. locked up. They got it, man. Like, so when you think about the, the customers who we're actually appealing to, we need to think about what their standards are um, and what their requirements are and what their expectations are and how your product appeals to their heightened sense of responsibility and enthusiasm for this field that they're entering into. Like, I like to train. Mm -hmm. um, I've been con I'm convinced that a Penix carry, for me, is the best solution. Uh, like Conrad mentioned in a comment a few minutes ago, I consider a spare magazine a secondary item. I do carry it. I always have one. But for me... Um, I agree with George Mathias that stuff for people problems goes forward of the hips and then support gear, spare magazine, tourniquet, etc. goes behind the hips. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a good guiding principle. So I would prefer to carry gun and knife up front rather than gun and spare magazine. Because if I'm locked up with somebody real tight, I'm probably not going to do a speed reload 
in the middle of a grapple. You're not going to stab them with your magazine. <laughs> Unless yeah. it's on the front of your gun under the dust cover. In which case, right to the throat. Well, muzzle strikes <laughs> right into the trigger. You're just going to wedge it into the device. Now, for uh, those of you who haven't seen it. On a serious sure, note, sure the if you've never taken a class that involves combatives and you carry a gun, you should take a combatives class. Um, if you're in the Indianapolis area or you're in Indiana, yeah, this thing. So everything that we've been talking about design, this solution is the complete polar opposite do not ever do this um and, it's, and it just so happens that today this uh <laughs> this showed up <laughs> in my feed just as we were going to start talking about design like, oh you know like, what do you think about design about... and then this and it's just like... right well we can start <gasps> we can start here with a counter example of what constitutes an effective solution? <laughs> yeah, seriously. And the, more, and the more ice lord I drink, just the funnier this gets. Well, so they should take this person's Autodesk or SolidWorks user license away. So, done. What the heck am I looking at, Matthew Bills? I don't really actually have any idea. The, I can't. Sometimes I see solutions on the market. And, uh, yeah, Aaron Brass, it's totally for real, unfortunately. Sometimes I see solutions on the market, and I am unable, unable to mentally reconstruct the decision-making process that led to that solution, that led to that product. Very oftentimes, I can look at a holster and see a set of priorities and a perception of the problem that clearly differs from mine, but it's identifiable. They valued this, I value something else. They executed against it this way, I would have done it differently, but I can see, I can comprehend, I can, I can put myself in their shoes and work through that design process. Some things like that, I'm out to see. I can't conceive of, of a way in which that legitimately addresses a problem in a way that improves the situation at all at all it it just right it's or, just the worst or improves it in the face of current solutions right like yeah how did i'll look at something and i'll wonder how did somebody not know about these incredibly popular you know, uh, 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 options that already right. do what they're trying to do. Yeah, like like popular and ubiquitous solutions, right? That like a solution which is everywhere, like 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 a like a wing feature or an angled clip or a or or a uh, in molded feature in, into the holster, which reduces grip printing. Like, my, my idea, it's like, well, you know, if a 17 prints too much, you can get a 19 or a 26. And if a 26 prints too much, you can just remove the entire grip of the firearm and keep the magazine <laughs> out of it. Like, that, that is not the logical next step. It's not, oh, well, if, 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 a, if a 19 grip conceals better than a 17 and a 26 conceals better than a 19. Then no grip at all conceals the best. Right. At which point. Well, yes, technically. That, that is that true. is true, but, but that's also creates a a world of insurmountable problems. <laughs> right? Like how do you get a full firing grip on a gun that doesn't have a grip? <laughs> ah. right, because it's a disaster. When you need your gun the most, the, what you absolutely want is for it to be... In pieces. Inaccessible and in several pieces. No, no, no. Now, now we had an idea. This is, like, totally brilliant. Um, we wanted to devise a way to have a modular, talkable, deep concealment 
ambidextrous solution that allows you to carry gun components and ammunition components. And not only assemble a firearm, but also on the spot in the firefight. Manufacture. Rounds. Manufacture ammunition. ammunition. <laughs> and then have some additional piece, it's like your speed load that you carry, where you've just finished setting your 357 SIG rounds. And then you put in your and then and then and then and then and then I've actually found a way to put an entire reloading setup into a Pez dispenser. Apply, <laughs> uh, applying the pressure is difficult, but the idea is that you... W Just spits out rounds. Nine right. mil! Nine mil! Right, you, nine put, mil. you put all the parts in it and you spit them out. Um, yeah. Man. It would be great if we could 3D print it. If we could 3D print it, it On would be spot, awesome. Actually, I've got a pocket 3D printer. <laughs> so, stop. The fight starts, you pull out your 3D printer and hit... Cycle start, and it starts building your Glock. 16 hours later, when you're dead in the street, the gun's finished. There's a short list. Like, I think the phrase, get you killed in the streets, is overused, except for when it becomes literally the truth. <laughs> so, bringing all that... I mean, we were just laughing about this stuff in the shop because we saw that picture, and you can't... You can almost not believe... Oh, we... The derp. We've been out for lunch. That We've been dining out on that thing all day, and it only gets better. Um, and, and and the more tired and delirious I become after a week of solid, like, 15-hour days in the shop and, and into my second Ice Lord, I'm, like, fading fast, man. Well, I'm still all the way here. So... Uh, a few more things I wanted to follow up on design. When it comes to testers, when I send things out to testers, I usually have very specific questions that I follow up with them on at a like a one week, a three week, a six week interval because I not only want to know initial impressions of the gear because like John mentioned, um, I think you mentioned it in our earlier video, but we also had a discussion about it. When people unpackage your product and first get it out, put a gun in it, handle it, use it, put it on, there is a le there's a real factor of perception of quality. Oh yeah, we were talking about yeah, the, we were talking about it in the shop. So, yeah. um, something that I recommend people read, and it, it, it made a big impression on me back in college. I had a, a, a professor in the class was about um, aesthetics. And the book was uh, Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And one thing that it discusses in great length, like through like allegory and storytelling and then occasionally directly, um, it discusses what quality is. Um, and uh, there's, there's a, uh, a famous line about um, someone was, it was like a, like a First Amendment case and someone was like, well, I, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know yeah, it when Supreme I see Court it. Yeah, Supreme Court justice. He said, I can't, I, don't, I can't define what pornography is, but when I see it, I know what it is. And in some ways, in, and actually in a lot of ways, quality is exactly like that. Difficult to define, So when you feel it, as, you feel it. As craftsmen who have um, uh, experience with certain things and are working in a certain field, we have definitive criteria like itemizable objective measurable criteria for, for what we define as quality now quality can be tolerance it can be fit it can be surface finish it can be uh, things that you can measure and improve but quality also comes in a sometimes it's almost supernatural the way quality exists it's like a sub-intellectual pre-intellectual instantaneous initial impression in which a huge amount of information is delivered to the user without them really studying it or rationally rationalizing evaluating it or it. evaluating it they might not even have the language to describe the experience that they're having but when they receive the package, open it, 
And in their initial observation of the thing and in their first contact with it, they get a lot of information about who you are, how you made the thing, whether or not you cared about it, and 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 their their life going forward with this thing in it. Like no, I'm, I'm no no I'm, serious, serious. Yeah, it's like, stuff. Like you know, there's a a whole emotional pre intellectual reaction to the thing. Which I've you been, are responsible for. And by I've the been way. totally divorced from this because as a holster maker, getting a new holster for me is not exciting. If you're a holster maker, you know you have like a drawer full of holsters and somewhere out in the shop you have an overflow tote bin of stuff that no longer fits in your drawer of holsters. And so getting a new holster is typically not that exciting. Um, but understand if you're a person who doesn't who does not Spent a lot of time around holsters. No, but I'm, I'm not going to say... I'm going to say that that... I'm very used to my own holsters. Yes. And I'm also very used to picking up other things and not experiencing that... That sizzle, that, like, that excitement. However, there are instances still when I'll interact with somebody else's product and... Uh, really get that vibe and it's we were talking earlier this evening about a holster we both saw from guncraft jeremy williams oh yeah this like, guy we both i mean i talked to jeremy not infrequently his work is among the most consistently clean and tasteful that i've seen anywhere in the holster industry and there's a particular holster is made with the uh knife kits raptor holstex block 19 xc1 Beautiful. Oh yeah, and 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 that transmission of the like, you know, precognitive. You just see it and you feel it in that instant. Yeah, if you want, um, if, if you want to understand what it's like to see that impression, like that that impression of quality, check out Guncraft. You should all know his stuff already, but if you don't, check it out. If you do know his stuff, go take a look at it again and see, because that package is all there. It's amazing. But the things that I was talking about, all these things about the design, all the, all the work that you do, all the reasons that you have for something, um, all of the work that you put into it, even in, an, in, in a customer where they might not necessarily be the most high information customer, they can still feel that quality because experiencing quality is a part of their on of, of their everyday life right it might not necessarily relate to holsters but it relates to other things in their lives they can tell the difference food clothes a car whatever and uh and that is a thing that is accessible through design and in fact I'd say that is only accessible through design. There are times where you can have uh, um, transcendent experiences with the natural world, and they transmit something different than quality. Right? That is a different, like the the feeling of being in awe of nature and creation, is substantially different from the feeling of interacting with another human made thing and that interaction with the with the thing as a as a point of communication and a point of transmission is an incredibly important and unique part of the human experience which you can create through the activity of design um and in the event that that doesn't occur it's not necessarily a fault or a flaw, but when it does occur, that is a point at which you are measurably improving the human experience for somebody else. So, the ability to uh, <laughs> Eric do, Powell do just that with, got here with some you consistency. You are late. I knife hand you. You're late. Is a great upside of um being involved in design 
One of the most rewarding parts of being a holster maker, although the majority of what I make is wholesale or OEM stuff for other companies, still one of the most rewarding parts of my job is when I hear back from somebody who received the holster I sent and they love it. There is nothing else that is a replacement for that experience. As a holster maker, um, when you put your time and energy into making an individual unit and you package it up and you send it out um, and you get a response from the person who says, I just opened up the package and I'm amazed by the holster. That makes you feel good. It should make you feel good. When it happens to me, it makes me feel good. And that's really satisfying. When somebody actually uses the thing that I made and their experience of it is not only uh, functional, but incredibly enjoyable. When they say, you know, it's so comfortable, the gun is so secure, the draw stroke is smooth, I love it. When that happens, that's the payoff you get from intentional, careful, tested design work. And it's a fantastic feeling. Solving problems is fun, Tom Kelly. And yes, Michael Hallam, you're right. It is a great feeling. Okay? It should make you feel good to make your customers feel great. Right. I mean, and what's important is the mutual experience that you have with them during which you discover that the things that you care about and were concerned about made it through. Made it through. That that your care was transmitted through the object to them. It might not be in ways that they can describe. Because it's great when someone says, oh man, the way you did this X thing yeah. is exactly the way I wanted to be. The way it fits or feels or the way it draws is really great. But it's more than that. It's that there are things in there that they can't describe that they like. And that resonates in a very deep way. Like the quantifiable ways in which these things, like the the the, the crafted thing, and this is for any craftsman. I, I'm pretty sure that you can sit down with any craftsman, anybody who's like a, like a, a creator at all, and know, and, 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 and they'll share this experience too, that sort of like, yes, you know, I listed off X, Y, and Z as things that I wanted this holster to do, or the things that I wanted this item to do, and that I cared about it. I've already sort of like pre-selected through marketing a group of users who are going to care about those things too. Yep. And to sort of satisfy them on that basic level is really, really satisfying. You know, like, I think Porsche is happy that drivers who like to drive fast like to drive Porsches, Right. <laughs> But I think they also are probably satisfied that when drivers who didn't know that they were going to like it that much dis- love it. discover a love for it or have an ex- – I'm almost happier when my user has an experience which they can't necessarily describe because now I'm giving them something new. Yes. And that's really special. The, the, the surprise – and the, 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 the reshaping of their perception of this whole category of things is important. And whether or not they really realize it or can describe it, the experience that they're having with the thing shapes their experience of other things as well. So it's going to sort of change their expectations of a number of other... Um, it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna change the bar... Or, or reset the bar by which they evaluate a lot of other things. And that's exciting. You get to interact with your users' lives in a very real, very tangible way and get feedback from them. One of the earlier comments a minute ago was about being grateful for congratulatory or positive comments and also really valuing constructive criticism. And this is something that I, I find in myself. I... I love getting good, you know, getting compliments back on my work from people who try my holsters out or get their package in the mail and enjoy it. But 
I am probably the most intense critic of my work. Oh, for sure. And sometimes the only way I actually enjoy my work is, is vicariously. Is vicariously right? It's like, totally bizarre. I'm, like, so, I'm so used to standing there at the buffing wheel and making a whole bunch of them and and getting going, well I guess go out. I mean like so it what's funny is that when I open up the package that I get from you of the components and I I can appreciate that but when the thing is done I almost appreciate it less because I've handled it right <laughs> like like my all of my 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 self doubt and my uh Self criticism completely contaminates the thing, right? Like I would almost be happier if I didn't touch them at all, because then I'm not like s subliminally ruining them for myself. But the the only way that it's satisfying is when the customer winds up liking it, because that's your validation, right? Because otherwise, it's just it's just some crap that I'm making, and everything I make is crap, and my whole life is crap, and I only do crap, and I'm just like, uh, it could be better, and I can only see the ways in which it could be better, you know? If you ever stop seeing the ways in which it could be better, that's a bad thing. But if you're unable to enjoy the ways in which it's good, that's an even worse thing. So, you know, have a sense of humor about yourself and your work. Um, we are, we've started a new hashtag. And we think you should use it too. And the hashtag is very simple. It's grind hard, brag humble. And it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing. Like it's, it's a play on the grind hard, stay humble hashtag. Because a lot of what the grind hard, stay humble hashtag is, is humble brag, humble brag, humble brag. And in case you didn't catch it, a humble brag at the end. Right. Or, and it's like not only am I working really hard, but I'm working, posting about it. I'm working really hard to create the appearance that I'm working hard. <laughs> um, because so, no, because because nobody can't not see me working hard because then they'll think I'm lazy and then I'll like they'll catch me slipping. One thing that was interesting that John said to me about when he started his YouTube videos, and I know many of you have watched a lot of them is that he set out to just document all his mistakes, all the things that went wrong, all the process problems, everything that hit the wall and went up in flames. And, and some things actually did go up in flames because and, I, did, I didn't know how to heat Kydex. I'm like, flames will work for this. Yeah, Tom, the blessed hashtag. I'm so glad I got 5,000 sales. Blessed. Um, blessed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty smarmy too. Um, but we're gonna be push. We're gonna be pushing on the uh, grind hard, brag humble hashtag. So if you want to jump in on that party, feel free. This is your invitation. Feel free to grind hard and brag humble on our hashtag. Immediately Some after hours. this, you should go find your pile of scrap. Yes. Photograph it. Yes. No. Go through all your boxes. Get all the scrap. Put it in one place so it looks like you just finished cutting all of it. Photo it like. Effect process post the prisma crap out of it, and then say and then then tag it with grind hard brag humble. Um, but you know I'm gonna uh, push my hands around in the gravel in your driveway so they look like I've been doing a lot of yeah. work. Oh, oh, look some at these and look go. at these dusty hands. Grind grind hard <laughs> brag humble. Um, you know I have not made a point of cataloging my mistakes, of which there are many, and setbacks, of which there are tons. So, so you keep them all secretly Some, and guiltily concealed. Well, not always. Like, <laughs> there are people I talk to about the things I'm facing in my shop that are challenging me, but today I posted a picture of a totally melted two by two foot piece of plastic that almost set my big vacuum former on fire. That is not fun. Oh yeah, that is the first time. And on top of it, in my shop, on top of I it, have yanked the fire extinguisher off the wall and gone running across the shop. And we're supposed to be like beyond, like wrecking machines. Like no, 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 no. We're not beyond wrecking machines. I talked to a guy who got twenty-five to thirty years of experience running a vacuum forming factory, and he said, "Yeah." Lighting plastic on fire in the vacuum forming machines is just kind of... That, that's vacuum forming. That just goes with the territory. 
And I was like, well, I haven't started any fires in mine yet, but I almost did today. Yeah. No, seriously, I, I I actually got the fire extinguisher off the wall and broke the safety tab and was ready to like throw down because I was afraid it was going up. I froze actually. I was standing there like uh, I don't have gloves on. I do, don't know what the plan is. I, I think I yelled, John, gloves, 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 <laughs> and we I hit the e stop tray out at the plastic like which was like just like inside the machine. We got it out before it became a molten puddle of flaming goo on the lower heaters in my vacuum former. I think And right. even better, we figured out why did it happened. And it's not gonna happen again for that same reason. No, it'll happen again for <laughs> completely. Yeah, reason. it'll happen for different reasons, but not for that same one. Right. Um and so what what I'm gonna try to do going forward from here is to be a little more deliberate about including my mistakes because I want to make sure you guys know I do not have it all figured out. I've got some cool machines. I make some good stuff. I work hard. That's true. But, like, every new level is a whole new world of problems. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like one of these video games where you grind and grind and grind and grind and grind and level up into a level where ever, all the work you've done is absolutely worthless. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, all the bad I got there! All the, the bad guys are impossible. Right. They're, they're, like, all the players and all the bad guys can one-shot you and you're a noob and you're a trash. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I've spent this whole year trying to grind and grind and grind and level up and now it's you know <laughs> it's now it's a whole new a whole new world of problems. It is a whole new world, a whole new battle. So we're gonna wrap up for the evening. John is headed back to Philadelphia tomorrow. So Pennsylvania will get your guy. It's been a pleasure to have him here. We've done a lot of great work in the shop. We prototyped some new things which you will see uh, hopefully fairly soon. It's it's a combination it, we've I've this week we've buckled down and we've made some new things which I'm going to be offering through the custom shop and we've uh, hit the first uh, level of prototyping on some things which are going to be uh, one, something which is eventually going to be available to you guys uh, yeah we've got some cool stuff coming out and uh, I think you guys are going to like it it's the kind of like uh, simple effective Says, I like that wedge shape. Yeah, we like it too. It only took a couple tries to get it right. How bad were the fumes? Michael Hallam, they were bad. I had oh. to open the garage door and all the windows and leave them open, and it was cold yeah. this morning. It was not fun. But it would have been even less fun if I had caught my expensive machine on fire. John, you haven't got the vac press going. Um, did you replace the membrane? It's a little leaky. Uh, you might. He he. This is the guy who got your giant BLT yeah, for. He me? got the, he got the donated old uh, Titanic uh, BLT former. Uh, shoot me an email, man, and uh, we'll figure it out. Yep. No big deal. It's pro. It's probably just a leak somewhere. So thank you for coming by. Thank you for hanging out this this evening. We may, if we have time, sneak in one more short live broadcast tomorrow around lunchtime. Once we've wrapped up things in the shop and John's got his bags packed for the flight back to Philly, uh, a few short plugs at the end. Uh, please like the feed if you haven't already. Uh, we appreciate your comments. If you have other questions or things you'd like to see answered while I've still got them here for another half day, post up comments on stuff over on John's Instagram page and we will get to them. Uh, I have an email list which is now fully operational, armed and fully operational over on my website, henryholsters.com. If you are a holster maker or interested in the work that I do with the Swift Press, with custom molds, with machining, with process applications for holster making, please go to henryholsters.com and sign up for the email list. I will not send you a whole bunch of spam. Um, and if you're in the market for a non-membrane former, the Swift Press has a coupon. It's FAST40 for 40 bucks off. So please check that out at henryholsters.com. Thank you guys very much for stopping by and spending your Monday evening with us. Tuesday evening. Tuesday? No, it's Monday. It's, it's Monday. Monday. This has been the weirdest week. Each day I lose track of which day it is. Yesterday was Sunday and I was convinced 
It was not. Well, because because we worked. I was totally lost. So uh, thank you guys for stopping by, and we will see you next time. Thanks Have a good for joining night. us.